So tonight we come to the final presentation and we have a wonderful presenter tonight. His, father, his name is Father Elochuku Uzuku. And if for nothing else, you should be impressed by how I say that name. <laughs> and uh, that I can say it with such clarity and without stumbling. But he's a member of my own congregation. He's a spiritan. And I'm very proud to pre present him to you tonight. He's uh, had a wonderful um, uh, history. He was ordained in, uh, in 1972. He's from Nigeria. And he was educated both in Nigeria and in Toronto, where he went to the University of Toronto and St. Michael's College, where he got both of his master's degree and his doctoral degree. He's taught in many countries. He's been in Dublin. He's taught in his own um, native uh, Nigeria. He's taught in Brazzaville, in the Congo. He's taught at Notre Dame, Xavier University, Menuth, the Institut Catholique de Paris, in Kinshasa, Zaire, and now he's at Duquesne University, which is a spirit and university, uh, and still going around helping people and continuing to inspire them with his teaching on faith and evangelization and mission. Um, his books, let me just tell you a couple of the books. I'm not going to go through all of his his, his publications, his articles, and so forth, it would be too long. He has a 12-page uh, curriculum vitae, so I can't do that. But listen to the title of the books that he has written. In 1997, Worship as Body Language, Introduction to Christian Worship. 1996, A Listening Church, Autonomy and Communion in African Churches. And in 1982, Liturgy, Truly Christian, truly African. Those sound all intriguing, don't they? Because it, the, the, it's precisely showing us how we have to go through the world looking uh, for how to bring this gospel to a whole variety of cultures. One of his greatest achievements, I think, is that he was a founding rector of a, a, uh, a, 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 an academic school in uh, Enugu, Nigeria, which is called the Spiritan International School of Theology. And the, 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 the reason that we established that uh, school there was precisely to address the question of how Christianity and the gospel interface with African cultures. And it's a very exciting place to be. In 1996, they had a Congress and they were coming together in this Congress to do four things. One, to give testimonies about their experience in bringing the gospel to a variety of cultures in Africa. Secondly, to enter into sociological analysis, which is so important in our understanding of peoples and their relationships. Thirdly, to do a theological reflection on that. And finally, to understand what mission meant in the third millennium. And when they came out of that Congress, they thought that they should have three major focuses for themselves. The first was going to be uh, the prophetic mission as key to social justice. What are the implications for the church and the missionary in situations where they have to be the prophetic voice? Secondly, to nurture self-confidence to overcome internalized oppression. That sounds really intriguing, doesn't it? When you go into a culture and you're trying to give people a sense of self-confidence where they feel that they're being oppressed so that they can find their own liberation. And thirdly, reconciliation and healing of memories. Oh, what a task our church has. Sometimes we get so turned in on ourselves that we think that our little world is everything rather than constantly looking out. I know I'm taking a little bit of time on this introduction, but I think it's important for you to know the kind of work that he's been doing and what he's going to bring to us tonight. Most importantly, that Congress said that the missionary is to be seen as a prophetic stranger who works to promote human dignity in opposition to a dominant culture of injustice. I wonder if we could apply that particular phrase to what the church has to be in our own culture, dominant culture here in the United States. 
it would be interesting to apply it and see how that unfolds. So what he's really been interested in all his life and all of his training has been inculturation, uh, interested in inculturation, liberation, and interreligious dialogue as the primary theological approaches to the way the church has to be in the world today. So without further ado, I want to present to you Father Elochuku Uzuku, and uh, I'm sure we're in for a wonderful ride and journey with him tonight. Uh, thanks very much, Don, for that in introduction. And uh, in fact, saying things that I've um, perhaps forgotten, especially uh, the emphasis on the Congress we had in 1996, insist. Thanks very much for that. Uh, uh, my topic is the Holy Spirit evangelization and culture. And you have already the image of the Holy Spirit. I begin with Pentecost, and I want to make four statements about Pentecost, the impact of Pentecost, uh, before I, I uh, uh, enter into um, the detail of uh, my presentation. The Holy Spirit at Pentecost was uh, mediating a universal language of peoples and cultures. I have, uh, I thought we have printed out the, the quotes so that I can go through the quotes pretty rapidly. Uh, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, the text you know well, and suddenly from heaven, there came a sound like a rush of violent wind and filled the entire house where they were all sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. First point about Pentecost. Pentecost made what appeared impossible for humans. Possible. God at Pentecost, as African Americans would say, was able to make a way out of nowhere. The confusion signified by Babel, you know Babel, Genesis, became history in principle, of course. Under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, Evangelization by the disciples of the risen Jesus displayed what God, who John calls life spirit, what God was eternally doing in God's world. Pentecost embodies the enduring presence of God's Holy Spirit in the world and the imperative nature of the evangelizing mission of the church. The church witnesses to the risen Christ, indeed, as you may have heard in other lectures, the church in the spirit must witness in order to be church. Woe to me if I do not preach, said uh, Paul. Second point about Pentecost. Pentecost, from the perspective of Christian witnessing, gives value to the human effort to understand the other the human effort to overcome conflicts and prejudices among and between peoples and cultures insofar as humans are n-spirited. I'm using a West African concept here. That is, uh, insofar as the bubble out of spirit to become human is to be full of spirit. Insofar as humans are n-spirited, their life actions are embedded in spirit, in freedom, and in creativity. Humans have always, in the past, and always in the present and the future, they have always been witnesses to the good, to the fraternal, to being brothers and sisters, despite the daunting shadow side of evil that trails 
every human action and human witness. As you read in the book of Genesis, God said to Cain, and if you do not do well, sin is lurking at the door. Its desire is for you, but you can master it. Humans are not naturally and culturally massa damnata, that is all damned, as Augustine would suppose. This optimistic anthropology that humans have always made an effort to protect their brothers and their sisters is not only a West African anthropology, it's also a biblical anthropology. Because God's spirit that brooded at creation over the waters, the wind from God that swept over the face of the waters was always there from the beginning, never left God's creation despite the fall, and continues blowing and nurturing freedom among humans. The wind blows where it chooses, says John, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it is going. So is God's spirit. So is God's commitment to human freedom. Pentecost, therefore, declares that the cultural and linguistic location of peoples is no longer present as a sign of contradiction, but a sign of unity and freedom. Languages and cultures display the many colors God's renewed creation has. The creation that has been groaning in labor pens until now is ever the theater of God's spirit and God's renewing presence. And as gift of the risen Christ, the spirit always is there in our world to slake our thirst. Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and let the one who believes in me drink. As the scripture says, out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. Third point about Pentecost. Pentecost clarifies God taking sides with those who proclaim from all time the humanness of peoples, whatever be their culture or their language. God takes sides with those who denounce and struggle against the marginalization of voices and other, and the marginalization of the other, simply because those voices are not like our own. At Pentecost, God stood on the side of those who struggle to make all voices heard, especially those who enable the culturally voiceless to get a voice. And that is why in the Acts of the Apostles, Luke would say, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of uh, Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. It is in line with the miracle of Pentecost that some African his church historians and missiologists see the translation of the Bible as the critical tool of Christian witness. Not only do African theologians say missionaries do not, did not bring God to Africa. Missionaries did not bring God to Africa. But rather, God in Jesus, through the miracle of Pentecost, brought missionaries to Africa with the message of Jesus. Not only did they say that, theologians from Africa try to suggest that translating the Bible 
chose Christianity as universalist in the sense of creating a transcendental, a wide openness, openness to mediate a conversation across linguistic and cultural borders. Translation radically displays how local cultures give hospitality to Christianity and at the same time shows how Christianity shapes local identity and acquires new identity. According to Bedi Yaku, or John Mbiti, as well as Lamin Sane, translation on the Bible, on the one hand, gave new Christian communities the instruments of continuity with a church that emerged at Pentecost. And on, on the other hand, it instituted the necessary local difference that must be nurtured among the Christian churches. Thanks to the spirit of Pentecost, the Bible in the church becomes an independent yardstick by which to test and sometimes to reject what Western missionaries taught and practiced and also provided the basis for developing new indigenous forms of Christianity. Of course, um, I'm not here in Texas uh, to talk perhaps about the African contribution to Christianity, but since I come from West Africa and from Nigeria, um, I don't think I can say anything without spicing it with this uh, African background. And the fourth point about Pentecost, Christian obedience to the spirit, the one on the driving seat of God's self-revelation is the core or inspiration of Christian witness. In the spirit, Christians come to an awareness of the profound sense that the word has become flesh. In other words, in the particularity of every culture and language, in the difficulty of understanding customs that are familiar or, and unfamiliar, in the necessary effort to purify and remove the humanizing practices in order to move peoples towards more humane ethical practices, the Holy Spirit testifies through the witness of the community that the life and death of Christ has overcome the world. Every cultural group, every cultural group in the world is ennobled and enabled to protect what enhances life and to reject and transform what dehumanizes. So, after this long presentation of, of Pentecost, I want to address three issues that come from the title of my presentation. First issue, evangelization. Evangelization as an imperative witness the church must bear I'm sure you had this before. The church in the Holy Spirit is born on eagle's wings to witness to God's work, the spreading of the good news of the kingdom. And here I will pause to point out the relevance of the teaching of Paul VI on evangelization today. Second point, the necessary connection between culture and evangelization. And here, I point out that the Pentecost miracle sets aside the Jonah complex, I will explain that later, or the cultural arrogance or exclusion practiced by many missionaries. Then I point to Alexandre Leroy, as Superior General of the Spirit as for 30 years, as one who endorsed fully the Pentecost principle. Third and finally, the imperative need of realizing that the Holy Spirit is on the driving seat of God's healing and reconciling mission in our world. I draw from the practice of Christ Christians from West Africa how 
fruitfully to be empowered by the indwelling Holy Spirit. And being empowered, one is enabled to mission for the integral health of humans, the integrity of creation, and the mystery that God is revealed, God is revealed in the religions, thanks to God's spirit. So, on evangelization, Paul said in his letter to the Corinthians, Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Vatican II is legitimately taken as perhaps the culminating point of the emergence of a new spirit of mission, and it is also seen as a point of departure for further developments. In the decree on the missionary activity of the church, Vatican II adopts this, the Trinitarian approach. The Trinitarian approach to mission. Mission begins not with the church, but with God. As spirit and missiologist Tony Gittins put it humorously, mission is what God does for a living. Okay. And therefore we say, miss your day. The famous text of Argentes captures this. The pilgrim church is missionary by her very nature since it is from the mission of the Son and the mission of the Holy Spirit that she draws her origin in accordance with the decree of God the Father. This decree, however, flows from the fount-like love or charity of God the Father. Uh, Bob Triter, also of Chicago, uh, is CTU, commenting on this insight of Vatican II, that mission is uh, Trinitarian says that mission is now something motivating the very heart of the church. It is only through mission that the church was drawn into the life of the Trinity itself. What is happening here? What is happening here? And what is being said is that thanks to the miracle of Pentecost, the church can never see itself as an island. The event of Pentecost and the missionary energy it generated reveals in the church's activity God's internal life as God. What happened at Pentecost and that is prolonged in mission is an insight into God's own life. Many church documents imply this, but I, I choose the document from the 1994 Synod of Bishops for Africa, and it's a very long text, so I, I, I choose it because I have not seen a description of the Trinitarian mission uh, in that sense. The Synod has highlighted, the document says, that you are the family of God. It is for the church as family that the Father has taken the initiative in the creation of Adam. So creation of Adam is mission. It is the church as family that which Christ, the new Adam, an heir to the nations, founded by the gift of his body and blood. It is the church as family which manifests to the world the spirit which the Son sent from the Father so that there should be communion among all. Jesus Christ, the only begotten and beloved Son, has come to save every people and every individual human being. Envy, jealousy, and the deceit of the devil have driven the human family to racism, to ethnic exclusivism, and to hidden violence of all forms. But Christ has come to restore the world to unity, a single human family in the image of the Trinitarian family. We are the family of God. This is the good news the same blood flows in our veins, and it is the blood of Jesus Christ, end quote. Mission theologians generally give credit to Protestants or evangelicals like Karl Barth and Karl Hartenstein that the mission of the church is obedience in the footsteps of, the, of God's mission. 
that it wasn't really something that was created by Catholic theologians, but by, by Protestant and evangelical theologians. And this was sharpened during the International Missionary Con Conference at Willingen in Germany in 1952. And that conference insisted that mission emanates from God's love in active relationship with humanity. And the, the late David Bosch of South Africa uh, summarized the impact of Willingen in this way. Quote, the classical doctrine of the Missio Dei mission of God asks God the Father sending the Son and God the Father and the Son sending the Spirit was expanded to include yet another movement, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit sending the church into the world. Willingen's image of, the, of mission was mission as participating in the sending of God. Our mission has no life of its own. Only in the hands of the sending God can it be truly called mission, not least since missionary initiative comes from God alone. This reinsertion then of the mission of the church within the heart of the Trinity helps us to appreciate the creativity of Paul VI in Evangelii Inunciandi, Evangelization Today of 1975, where evangelization as witness to the kingdom and the renewal of the church are dominant themes. The papal exhortation, Evangelization Today of 1975, was inspired by the 1974 Synod of Bishops. That synod was a synod that was held at a critical time in the perception of mission. Protestants, during the World Missionary Conference of Bangkok, Thailand, in 1972-73, had called for a moratorium. Stop, a moratorium on mission. Stop missioning. And African bishops, during the synod of 1974, distanced themselves and therefore rejected the position of some African theologians who called for a moratorium, a stop, asking the missionaries to pack bag and baggage and go home. The bishops were insistent, however, on mission as co-responsibility. Missionaries and the local African churches collaborate in evangelization. Evangelization today did not directly address the issue of moratorium. However, the preference of this document for evangelization instead of mission indicates an important shift. If the document states clearly that the kingdom is the one and only absolute, it is to draw attention to the nature of the church as church. Quote, as an evangelizer, Christ, first of all, proclaims a kingdom, the kingdom of God, and this is so important that by comparison, everything else becomes the rest, which is given in addition. Only the kingdom, therefore, is absolute, and it makes everything else relative. Uh, Article 8 of Evangelion, the, the kingdom that Jesus proclaimed, the only absolute, does not leave the church complacent the church must ever be, be evangelized herself and transformed in order to be a credible evangelizer. Evangeline Nusandi again, Article 15. The church as an evangelizer is an evangelizer, but she begins by being evangelized herself. She is the community of believers, the community of hope, lived and communicated, the community of brotherly love, and she needs to listen unceasingly to what she must believe, to her reasons for hoping to the new commandment of love. Unquote. Evangelizing, proclaiming, and living the absolute, the kingdom, is first and foremost witness of life, of any Christian community, anywhere, anytime in the world. And Paul the sister again, modern man listens more willingly to witnesses than to teachers. 
And if he does listen to teachers, it is because they are witnesses. The complexity of the evangelizing mission that addresses the self of the church and addresses the other through witness of life addresses profoundly the context, the culture, or cultures of humans. This is the way evangelization today tries to replicate the miracle of Pentecost by establishing a conversation with all languages, with all cultures, no matter how difficult the task is, any day, any time, any place. What matters is to evangelize man's culture and cultures, not in a purely decorative way, as it were, by applying a thin veneer, but in a vital way, in depth, and right to the very roots. Again, that's uh, Paul VI. These profound words of Paul VI introduce us to the question of evangelization and culture. Culture and evangelization are intimately connected. The history of mission in the modern period makes an interesting reading, about the, especially the, about the approach of Western missionaries to peoples and cultures. In contrast to the Pentecost miracle, Philip Labutatorla, a French anthropologist, has drawn attention to the Jonas complex or the profound prejudices that dogged many missionaries, including spiritual missionaries. The Jonah complex. If you look very well, you see Jonah in, the, in that trying to pro proclaim from the mouth the well. Huh. Terms like primitive, uncivilized, barbaric, and so on, we are current. Jonah resisted the mission to Nineveh. Even when he was dragged, screaming to Nineveh, thanks to the mystical well, he did not applaud the result of his own preaching. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed their fast and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. Instead of applauding, Jonah was angry. Oh Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you are a gracious God and forgive and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. He wasn't a happy man. Why the Jonah complex make missionaries exaggerate the difference between my own country and their country, our people and these people. The miracle of Pentecost insists that mission belongs to God. That mission is what God does for a living. However, a number of remarkable missionaries appreciate the profound connection between diversity of peoples and languages and the mission of the church. Mission that is continuous with the Pentecost miracle. Torla illustrates with two French and one German uh, missionaries. He sees in the lives of John de Brebeuf, Jesuit missionary to the Huron Indians in Canada, Herman Nekesh, German Palatine missionary to Cameroon who translated the Catechism and the Bible into Ewondo, the language of Cameroon, and Alexandre Leroy, spiritual missionary to East Africa, and superior general for 30 years, he sees in them people who appreciated the intimate connection between anthropology and missiology, even before the discipline of anthropology was firmly established. I comment on the, on the two French missionaries. Labutatole was uh, a French anthropologist who did most of his field work in Cameroon. He noted that among the Jesuit missionaries to North America, John de Brebeuf, uh, 1587 to 1649, he stood apart. 
in sharp contrast to his hostile confederates. De Brebeuf applied a method of what anthropologists call today participant observation. He was not only proficient in the Huron language, lived as one of the Huron Indians, was schooled in athletics as any Huron, trekking over 30 to 40 kilometers a day, incessant in row rowing canoes, enduring in sanitary conditions, cold, heat, nakedness, poorly clad, but he was culturally constructed, hardened in Huron style to proclaim the one absolute, the kingdom. When he was captured by the Iroquois Indians and tied to the stake, he applied all the Huron acquired virtues in proclaiming the kingdom. He continued preaching from the stake until his tongue was cut off, his arms chopped off and eaten, and his heart gouged out and eaten to imbibe his strength and bravery. What is of interest to the anthropologist is not only that the de Brebeuf was a missionary who suffered martyrdom. The issue here is that he immersed himself completely into the Huron world and culture, what we call today acculturation. And this enabled him to effectively preach the word of the kingdom. Perhaps this is what Paul VI meant when he insisted that the relationship between the gospel and culture must be profound and not superficial. Paul VI also said in Evangelii Nunciandi, the gospel and therefore evangelization are certainly not identical with culture. They are not identical with culture, but they are independent in regard to all cultures. Nevertheless, the kingdom which the gospel proclaims is lived by men who are profoundly linked to a culture and the building up of the kingdom cannot avoid borrowing the elements of, the, of human culture or cultures. And now, spirit and missionary to Gabon and East Africa, Monsignor Alexandre Lourou. The dates are there. Have this seen. Uh, developed this idea of gospel and culture before it was ever thought through by the 1974 Synod. He was the general of, of Spiritans between 1896 and 1926. He insisted that the missionary must be a scientist. This does not mean that Leroy was not a child of his time. Like a good Frenchman, the missionary proclaiming the gospel still represents his country of origin, embarks on the task of civilization of the primitives or barbarians. But Leroy was different. He was different in insisting beside all these and directing all these that the missionary has the role of a scientist. Chief among the tasks is study and language of the country, the terrain, the peoples, physical geography, population density, habits, laws and customs of the land, and above all, the language. All this type of what you call culture. This will facilitate the progress of the gospel, but also the progress of knowledge. That's why he calls it a scientist. Knowledge of the language and taking note of the people's terrain, rivers, mountains, and so on, we correct the many errors of travelers and cartographers who accumulated secondhand information that are unscientific. And Lurua stands in good position to say this, because not only did he develop the, the grammar of Kiswahili in East Africa and provided the first Kiswahili dictionary, but he was the first Frenchman to climb Mount Kilimanjaro at a height of 4,800 4, meters and celebrate mass on Kilimanjaro. The missionary method of Leroy touches profoundly the culture, the context, and the religion of peoples. But he says, one's disposition must be directed by the Pentecost principle rather than the Jonah complex to effectively know the history and cosmology of the peoples, their origin and political systems, their civilization, uh, the condition of the slave and the free, 
the relationships between men and women, morality and behavior, the missionary must not only be accepted and respected by the people, he must be loved by them because he respects and he loves them. He must become like Paul, all things to all people. The missionary must know the rules and customs because often, oftentimes his adopted community appeals to him to arbitrate in difficult cases. This gives the missionary, on the one hand, the opportunity to play the role of an expert and on the other hand, enables him to correct or suggest what should be changed in the laws and customs of the people. Leroy went as far as correcting the prejudices common in the 19th century Western anthropology and uh, stories of travelers and missionaries by insisting that there are no people without a civilization. The savages Europeans talk about are only found in their cities and created by their cities. Leroy also spoke about the importance of patient and detailed empathetic study of local religion for effective evangelization. I, I put this slide that may not be expected. Uh, this is an unexpected slide. Okay. He, uh, he spoke about the importance of patient and detailed empathetic study of local religion for effective evangelization. Here, the missionary will discover surprising parallels to adopt as well as accretions that must be rejected. These are necessary for the proclamation of the gospel. That is why Leroy was who was superior general uh, for 30 years, insisted on an all-round formation for spiritual missionaries. The study of religion, especially the role of spirits in West African religions, is an area where good scientific formation is required, not only for discernment of spirits, but also for a fatal encounter between traditional religion, culture, and Christian evangelism. Uh, that um, on my left is uh, a, a voodoo, and when I, I, I said voodoo sacrifices, in the, in, the, in the dictionaries and in the encyclopedias, you hear spelled voodoo. Nobody ever calls it voodoo, you know, and it has been negatively defined as uh, uh, a, a, a wicked kind of religion because of Haiti, which is totally and absolutely inaccurate and wrong. The religion originates from West Africa. Voodoo simply means spirit. It's a dominant way of appropriating the gift of God. And in Togo still, voodoo religion forms seven, the, the, the greatest percentage of, of the practice of religion in Togo in West Africa. The women uh, who are dancing are in a, in a ritual context, and they can be taken possession of by the spirit, or whatever spirit that possesses them for healing remedies. And that's a, a voodoo priestess and a, the same voodoo priestess. And those are elements of sacrifice. But also interesting, I put up this, um, uh, this slide for, for, from the drum. I don't, I, don't, I don't want to talk about a drum and its impact in religion. You know, like that the drum speaks. Every drum has is a text and says something. Uh, for example, in the drum, Abron drum text, you say, you tell you, uh, if you notice that in the morning, a bird remains sadly sitting on a branch. What's the answer? This is because it has not yet said good morning to God. Now, this is, this is the sound of the drum saying it. It has not said, it has not said good morning to God before it starts singing. Okay. Now, uh, in, I conclude uh, where I started uh, with the Holy Spirit as the initiator of mission the driver of God's mission and the builder of solid bridge between the religions and one that reveals to the believer that Jesus is Lord. So the Holy Spirit on the driving seat.
Don't run away from the uh, Pentecostals and the Charismatics. No. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God, Paul says. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. In Evangelion and the evangelization today, Paul VI wrote, though independent of cultures, the gospel and evangelization are not necessarily incompatible with them. Rather, they are capable of permeating them all without becoming subject to any one of them. So the Jesuit missions that you see in Americas, the spiritual mission that you see in Africa, encountered cultures that are not just only different cultures, but they are religious cultures. The most difficult level in the encounter between gospel and culture is religion. Christian history cho shows us that philosophies are easier to relate to than religions. It's easy to adopt Platonic philosophy, Aristotelian philosophy, but it is very difficult to adopt the Roman, Greco-Roman religions. But Alessandro Leroux at Spiritan considered religions encountered by the missionaries as a vital basis for transmitting their Christian faith. The elements of religion that he mentioned, which are of interest to this final segment of my presentation, uh, they are as follows. A supreme being that dominates the world. I'm not, I remember, not that I didn't bring in any of the so-called great religions. I'm talking about religion on the ground, you know, as practiced on the ground. Like this kind of religion, on the ground. Now that this, the, the supreme being that dominates the world, spirits that are friends of humans, spirits that wish humans no good, and therefore you need people who are properly initiated to control them. The survival of the soul, sacrifices, and so on. In West Africa, in particular, Spirits or deities have been an area of incredible controversy. These are numerous and each has an area of competency of, for healing and commerce with human, the human community through initiates and through devotees. Two attitudes were generally adopted and are still adopted. First, diabolizing, making diabolic the deities or the spirits as not being friendly to Christians even though one recognizes the healing powers that devotees ascribe to the deities and the spirits. This attitude is similar, it's not different, uh, from the attitude of Paul and Silas at Philippi, where they met a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners a great deal of money by fortune telling. The girl went along with Paul and Silas announcing these men are slaves of the Most High God who proclaim to you a way of salvation. Paul was annoyed at the, by this and decided to exorcise the spirit as being foreign or inimical to the name of Jesus. And so Paul said, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. Now that is one dominant Christian attitude to religions, to deities. And this is Paul, and Paul, of course, chose another side, but this particular side related to a spirit of divination Paul did not like at all. Now, another and a second more nuanced attitude is adopted by African Christian converts, especially those who belong to the African-initiated churches. They take to heart the dictum of Paul when we say, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. We are children of God. Okay. In other words, our union with God is a mystical union. An intimate connection that happens thanks to the Holy Spirit the fusion between the human spirit and the divine spirit. This union follows a process of the descent and indwelling of the Holy Spirit, similar to the process 
of the mystical union with the spirits or deities of traditional religion that enable devotees and initiates to perform acts of healing. In this process, there is a transformation of the deities of traditional religion into the qualities of the Holy Spirit. Now, I've tried to argue this in a, a book that I hope will be published at the end of this year, that what happened in the Hebrew religion is happening in the Christian appropriation of Christianity. The Hebrew religion, at least up to the time of uh, second Isaiah, the, uh, the, second, uh, the exile in, in, uh, in Babylon, the Hebrew religion transformed radically all the images of the Canaanite deities, making them either spirits, or rather either uh, yeah, angels in, in favor of God, or devils, like Beelzebul that became the prince of devils. And then also the qualities of the Canaanite deities were transformed into the qualities of the one and only Yahweh. So when I look at what is happening in the Christian practice, I see the healing practices that dominate uh, the, uh, the, the practice of Christianity in West Africa as a transformation of the healing qualities of the various spirits and deities into the qualities of the Holy Spirit. In fact, the uh, African initiated churches in their Congress in 1996 proclaimed the renewal of the Holy Spirit, renewal of the Holy Spirit is continuous with and greater than the spirits around us. Our dependence on the Holy Spirit for protecting from evil for, for protecting from evil forces has liberated us to share with others our freedom from fear, a very enticing proposition in the African context, as well as in the rest of the world. So this is where I round off my presentation, and I do this uh, with a proposal, proposal of positioning the Holy Spirit on the driving seat, driving seat of the church's life and mission in the world. And I say, this does three things. Three things for the Christian faith and Christian life. First, through the Holy Spirit, each convert, each Christian, each convert to Christianity is enabled to recognize the Lordship of Jesus Christ. An important Christian entry into the mystery of the Trinity. As Paul rightly said, no one can say Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Second, each Christian lives a deep Christian and mystical or spiritual life through the Holy Spirit that indwells, descends and indwells in the Christian. The indwelling Holy Spirit enables life-enhancing relationships, directs the self-remodeling or remaking of the Christian through intensive merging of identities of the possessed and the spirit that possesses, container and contend being fused. And finally, this new reality leads to a new understanding of mission, a new understanding of religions, cultures, and evangelization. As the indwelling Holy Spirit enables the confession of Jesus as Lord, the same spirit opens a new understanding of difference in cultures and religions. The spirit that brooded over the waters at creation never left the world and is present and reveals the spirit self in the religions other than the Christian religion in a manner known only to God who is spirit. As Gaudium Space says, this enables new relationship of respect and dialogue with peoples of other faiths. The spirit is acknowledged across religions, across cultures and faiths as a spirit of understanding and a spirit of unity. I thank you. Uh, thank you. Father, yeah. I'm going to put that. Um, in my old uh, Anglican life, I remember listening to 
missionaries and and people in the far north of Canada and Alaska, the Inuit or Eskimo people, talking about their experience of becoming Christians and their conversion was so powerful that they um, they wanted to forget their old culture and embrace um, what they considered a, a brand new Christian culture. And it was the cultural anthropologists that had to keep telling them, no, you need to not forget your roots, your past. And I, I wonder if that's true in your experience as well, that, um, that when people do come to Christ, um, they want to leave those things behind. Yeah, I like uh, the way you put it. They like to leave those things behind. Yeah, there is, um, uh, especially for those who are converted as adults, uh, there is that feeling. And, but for us who, uh, well, I mean, didn't Tertullian object? Tertullian objected to child baptism precisely from that perspective uh, that we are not born Christian. We are made. You know, we, we, we have to take a decision. But for us, we are born Christians. Like I was baptized you know, when I didn't know I was baptized. It is something else. You know. um, they, because they, uh, in, in a place like among whether the Indians or whether the Africans or Asians, like the area of traditional religion, the religion is so interwoven with the culture you know, that to leave those things behind is only when there is a crisis that you see that you have really left nothing behind. When you have a crisis, crisis of life, you know, crisis of uh, uh, serious ill health, you know, crisis that um, um, uh, show that, the, that Christianity or the Christian, the received Christianity does not really have an answer for this. You know, it is then that you start you know, perhaps backpedaling and like uh, uh, um, uh, we call them fallen, fallen Christians, the lapsy. You know. So yes, I do know that um, some of the, the bishops, uh, some people who were made bishops and in, in my home, and I know that they were converts. They are the most difficult people to deal with in the area of inculturation. They're the most difficult people to deal with because for them it is paganization as far as they're concerned. You know, uh, while people who have a, a better uh, appreciation and a, a better training in, in anthropology as well, we realize that it is not paganization. That the long list of the Christian rituals uh, where practically a takeover after the Christians had, you know, had uh, castigated them, a takeover of the Greco-Roman ritual patterns. Whether you like it or not, that's, that's clearly the, the case. Yeah, so that's it. Father, you spoke of the charismatic renewal, yeah. and it sounded as though it sort of began in Africa. Uh -huh. um, you quoted Guatemala as 20% Pentecostals and 40% uh, Charismatic. <clears throat> I used to work there, and I know in our little town of La Democracia, Weiwei Tenango, the Pentecosteses were very strong. And I just wondered if you could explain a little bit on how those, that movement began. It's yeah, relationship you know, to Africa. Yeah, you know that the Pentecostalism began here in the United States. It didn't begin in Africa. Though, okay, though a, a, a brand of churches that are called, and that have, I called, African initiated churches, these, yes, began in, in Africa as a uh, uh, splinter groups from the mainline missionary churches, perhaps for one or two reasons. The first reason, especially in the Southern African region, was a reaction against racism. 
Uh, the second reason, as in a place like Nigeria, was the ineffective Christian uh, attitude to health and wholeness, ineffective. That health was not being looked at in a holistic way, that one can pray and get better, you know. And so that, in, for example, in, in 1918, there was the Christ Apostolic Church, a branch of the Christ Apostolic Church in Nigeria that uh, moved away from the mainline church and called itself a praying church, the praying church. They're called Aladura in Yoruba, Aladura, Aladura in Yoruba. So yes, uh, but, but the, 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 the dominant Pentecostalism, the whole uh, religion of experience started in the uh, in the United, United States, and uh, a lot of modern day Pentecostalist movements in Africa have also their ties to the United States. Father, based on your experience in the Congo. How widespread and, and active is the Zairean rite? Yeah. Um, the Zairean rite is one of those interesting developments. Um, you know, uh, part of the history of ritual in Zaire uh, would date back to the 16th century, not just not uh, to the uh, 20th century, you know, when the first evangelizers came to the old Congo kingdom, which we cover areas around Angola today and the ancient Congo. Um, the, uh, the, there, is, there was a development then of particular patterns of uh, Christian art way back 16th, 17th century you know, uh, that we are typically Congolese, you know, in, in, in that way. But of course, it was a Latin rite. It was a Latin, also Latin mass. Everything was chanted in Latin as well. What the way it was in Portugal, so was it in the Congo, you know, the, 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 the ancient Congo kingdom. Uh, the first, you know, they, they had a, a bishop then in the sev uh, 17th century, Enric, who was the, the son of the king of the Congo then. Know, who was made a bishop, and they had a, they had um, a papal a representative of the of the of the Congo Kingdom in the Vatican. He, as a matter of fact, he died in the Vatican. So, but but th that period of time, uh, the, there was a church that flourished in the Congo with Portuguese missionaries, with Italian missionaries. Okay, then the slave trade uh, the peaked. And in, uh, missionaries, especially the Jesuits, were involved in slavery. You know, so slavery radically destroyed whatever you had in the Congo as a Congo church. But there were remnants of art and architecture. You know that that still uh, was represented a Congo church then. So because by the 19th century, when the new missionaries came to the Congo, what they found there, they said it wasn't a Christian church. Okay, that's first level of answer. So, so like, uh, I want to show, that, uh, tell you that right from uh, the, the, the period of Christianization, the, period, the first period of contact uh, in the 15th century, 16th century, 17th century, between the Congo Kingdom and the church in Portugal and in, in Italy, right from that time, there was a clear interest in making their church local. That was uh, clear, historically. But uh, after the... After, well, when the Vatican Council uh, II was called, be, even before the Vatican Council II, there were all already work in the Congo to reform the liturgy because of the liturgical movement. The liturgical movement touched the Congo through the Belgian uh, liturgical movement. And the, the cardinal, the, the, sorry, the bishop of Kinshasa, then uh, Cardinal Malula, was part of the committee in the pre a conciliar committee that worked on the liturgy. Uh, he was the only African, really, that worked, you know, before the council. So after the after the council and the new liturgy was established in 1969, there was the missal of Paul the Sixth, and this missal of Paul the uh, Sixth uh, is now the universal Vatican II missal. 
and published in 1969. As soon as it was published, the Congo Church Episcopal Conference, they started work on developing a liturgy that is at home in the Congo. And by 1973, they already had a text. And they were permitted by the Vatican to use that text uh, and in an, on an experimental mood. When I arrived in the Congo, I was, in living, I was living in Brazzaville, uh, that liturgy was being celebrated. I, was, uh, I, I participated in it, and, and um, I must say I, I, I enjoyed it, but there, there were difficulties because you move from one ethnic group to another, and one ethnic group will tell you that this is Bandundu culture and not necessarily uh, the, uh, the, the culture of everyone in the Congo. But the idea is to have a, a master a plan that you can adapt from place to place. Now, that liturgy was being used from 73 until 1988. In 1988, then there was produced a missile called the Roman Missile for use in the Diocese of Zaire. It is, it is the official Zairean rite that is being used. Okay, no, it, because there, it's never, it was never called the Zairean rite. In the Congo, they call it the Zairean rite. But in Rome, it is called the Roman Missal for use in the Diocese of Zaire. Yeah. Uh, Father, but is, is that widely used? Pardon me? Is, is that right? Uh, is, is that missile Absol widely used? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, in the 1994 Synod of Bishops in Rome, the relator of all people, the, 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 the relator, the person that was secretary to this synod, and uh, uh, read out what are the viewpoints before the synod, during the synod, and at the end of the synod, was uh, Cardinal uh, Hyacinth Tian Doom of Dakar, who is certainly not a radical archbishop. And Cardinal Tian Dung did state clearly that the viewpoint of the churches in Africa is that the Zairean liturgy approved in 1988 was not a privilege, but a right. He stated it clearly. This is our right, not a privilege. Of, um, unfortunately, what's happening today is that the bishops are not courageous enough uh, to affirm that Vatican II has introduced a way of worship and also a way of understanding liturgy uh, 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 based on various sociocultural areas, you know, uh, uh, doing things in a way that is Catholic, in a way that is Christian, and in a way that is continuous with Pentecost as of, of right, not a privilege. Uh, bishops today are more um, either they are not properly informed or perhaps they don't know what their, their, their duties are. Yeah. One of the things that I heard people talking about the most in, during the break is voodoo. Oh. And uh, they want you to address that because they don't seem to understand it. Yeah, no. And uh, what I was thinking about when you were talking about it was the fact that Charles Davis, the philosopher, has said that in the West we have lost what we call an enchanted universe. Yeah. And by enchanted, he meant seeing spirits everywhere mm -hmm. and seeing both good spirits and bad spirits and being able to relate those then to the gospel. So, uh, what was the main point you were making with this so that it can clear up for us and we don't go out here wondering whether we're becoming voodooists or not, <laughs> but uh, to, to, to allow us to understand and appreciate yeah. really what you were saying and the point where you were ta talking yeah. about the, the spirit shedding yeah. its rays of light. Yeah. I must say that this is one of... It, this is one of the most difficult, if not the most difficult aspect of, um, um, first of all, generally, uh, uh, the encounter between uh, gospel, religion, and culture. But for West Africans, this is the most difficult area. Um, uh, it doesn't leave anybody at ease, whether you are a Christian or a, a follower of voodoo. You know, because that controversy is not 
uh, why it is, it is difficult is that it's not as if it is something of the past. It is something of the present. That's a problem. Now, if it were something of the past and we are doing archaeology, then, okay, nobody's bothered. They're all dead and we sweep them away. And if there are any remnants in our life practices, well and good. But it is something of the present. Uh, on the terrain, in a popular, on a popular level like this, now this is a religion that is not politicized. That's popular. But during the era of slavery, this religion was hijacked. Hijacked by political hierarchs. And especially in a place called Dahomey. Now, you must, may have heard of Dahomey. Dahomey uh, is very close to a place called Togo in West Africa. And it, uh, Dahomey is the only slave, enslaving kingdom founded and funded by slavery. It was a very wicked kingdom, wicked. And they, they did all, all sorts of evil. And they wanted, they wanted to collude with the voodoo priests. But they couldn't get them. They couldn't do that. You know, the, 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 the voodoo priests rejected uh, what you can call using religion as an instrument to justify an unjust kingdom. Now, Dahomey could not survive after slavery because Dahomey didn't have any other. It's just like the Jesuits in Angola. Aqua Viva told them to st stop slavery. The Jesuit superior general in Spain told the Jesuits to stop slavery. And the Jesuits in uh, Angola said, in Luanda said, they cannot stop slavery because that is the on their only means of livelihood. That's true. And that's on record. Now, uh, the same with the kingdom of, the, of Benin, uh, sorry, of Dahomey. The kingdom of Dahomey was built on slavery. And as soon as slavery came to a, an end, Dahomey came to an end. Now, when Dahomey then was to be independent from France, there was a problem. What name should it take? They couldn't, I mean, the whole nation could not take the name Dahomey because Dahomey was evil. Evil, evil yes. The, as a kingdom, was evil. You know, they did all sorts of evil things in Dahomey. And that's why they came to Nigeria and picked the name Benin, the Republic of Benin. Benin is a city in Nigeria. And they picked the, 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 the name Benin and made the whole country Republic of Benin. Okay. So that's one side of the story. Okay, there is no religion that is not instrumentalized. Christianity has been instrumentalized. People went to war in the name of Jesus and carried the cross. It's, same, it's a similar thing. Just you can, as well as you can instrumentalize Islam or any other religion. You know, I, I always used to applaud Buddhism. But Buddhism, but I was, uh, uh, when I started teaching a, a course on general study of religion and I had to do, deal with the, the, the Japanese style of Buddhists, you know, same Buddhism in Japan, I didn't understand how Japanese monks could use the practice of, of Buddhism to go to war and kill. It's amazing, it's, it's, it astounded me because it was totally contrary to the text of Buddhism, you know, to the non-violence non non of Buddhism. So, what I'm trying to say here is complex and it is provocative and I wanted to put, up, put it up that way uh, to say uh, we are trying to interpret what is happening on the ground for practicing Christians. What is happening, the difficulties they are facing and who are providing the solution. There are two ways of looking at this religion. One way is this is diabolical. That is the Pentecostal, radical Pentecostal. And in one way or the other, some mainline churches may go that way, but not the mainline churches don't, do not really go that as far as these people because the mainline churches will still use candles and other uh, things to, to, uh, in their rituals. But then the, the churches that are called African-initiated churches, they are mainly Holy Spirit churches and healing churches. They have totally transformed this. They reject the, the spirits. Clearly, they reject them. They don't name the spirits. But every 
one of the function of the spirits that you find in voodoo is adopted. Every one of the healing functions, you know, the spirit that heals those who have headache, the spirit that heals those who have stomach ache, and so on. And so within their churches, you have people who are empowered, women mainly, women mainly, because voodoo is dominated also by women, you know, who function as healers, you know, and as herbalists as well. So we have women who have, who, who, though they will never be pastors, but they will be ministers within the church. And they, uh, they can pray for you, they can uh, uh, take care of, peop- of, of kids who are having problems in school and people cannot, who, who cannot uh, pass their exams or people who are having difficulties living with, with their parents or, and so on. And they create a home for them within the church compound or people who are attacked by evil spirits or people who are attacked by witches and so on, issues of witchcraft and sorcery. These churches can handle them. Not only that they can handle them, they name these issues, which our own churches, our own churches, we say, okay, we know there's a devil. Okay. We know that there's a devil. But we don't really name the particular uh, spirit. And, and we, we are not too interested. You, you may have one or two exorcists in one diocese, you know, if they, if they exist at all, you know, to exorcise. But uh, uh, evil and spirits, these things are real. And someone has to be empowered to fence off the, the spirits. And the other matter, of course, is simple. That there is no radically, now I, I pick my words, no radically evil spirit in the West African world. There cannot be a spirit you call devil. It, did, it doesn't exist. All the spirits called devils, they, or rather the word demon, devil, is the name of a local deity. Like in my home, the, the, what is taken among the Igbo, and what has going, gone into our Bible translation and the catechism is that the devil is Ekwensu, Ekwensu. But I know, I know, I know the, the, the shrine, where it is, it, the Ekwensu lives. There's a shrine there, it's on a hill, as a matter of fact, I was driving through it uh, during the last vacation. I couldn't because it was raining. And people uh, don't like to go that, uh, to climb that hill because it is slippery. You know, and it's called the hill of Ekwensu. That's the hill of the devil. Now, uh, 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 Christians today, we call it the hill, hill of, the, of the devil. But uh, it wasn't the devil because it's a, a local deity, a, perhaps a violent deity, but not really a completely evil spirit. Now that, but but, but uh, uh, Christians have been able and successfully at that, they have been able to pick these spirits and demonize them and make them demons. And therefore, you will, you, you will start hearing bishops writing letters and advising Christians, don't see devils everywhere. But what do you want? If you have made every deity that is there being worshipped a devil, why wouldn't people see de- devils everywhere? Uh, now, the, the task of theology is what? The task of theology is to do a first, of all, a, a first level uh, anthropology and to say that our language is wrong. You know, this is, we, we, didn't, we, 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 we didn't go to, through the process of the Jewish Christian tradition where Baal, Baal, a Canaanite deity, uh, during the period of Jesus was already named Beelzebul, the prince of devils. And it was accepted by Jesus and the people around him. They, they, they demonized all the Canaanite deities that could be performing some good things. Now, it, it, to make the, 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 this deity a radical, radically uh, uh, evil deity. And that's what you call dualism. It, and it is dangerous. Dualism in itself Conceptually, it's dangerous because it means there is a province that belongs to this evil spirit at war with God. Well, what kind of God will allow that kind of evil spirit to have that kind of territory? That's a problem in itself. Theologically, it's so difficult to work out. And Christianity has not really left that dualism. What is the solution? I'm not telling you I know know what the solution is. Uh, what what I, 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 I do and what I did in, in, uh, in, in a recent book is to say 
I think I have a, 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 some opinions that I need to express. That first of all, we, we are wrong in categorizing spirits that we don't understand and naming all those spirits devils. That this in itself is wrong. But we must also do something about our own Christians. We do it by learning from what other Christians who are not Catholics are doing. So, if, that, if this makes sense, of course. I'm not saying, for example, that especially if you go to a place like Haiti and a place like Cuba, you must, you must find the Vodou religion in Haiti. You have the Vodou religion in Cuba. You have uh, in Bahia, it's very flourishing. Candomblé is flourishing. Uh, yeah, if you come to Nigeria, for example, also you, in, in the beaches, you see sacrifices being offered. There, there are. Some certain things going on I don't understand I, that I have not followed. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, I have dragged this. I'm sorry about that. Okay. 